I talk pretty fast, so I've kind of put a lot of words onto my slides, but I don't plan on reading them word for word, so um, that will give everyone kind of a chance to just read them themselves. But I wanted to thank ACHS for asking me to be a presenter, and also everybody who's taken time out of their day to listen in. Thank you. Uh, for being here. So why yoga? For me, um, I started practicing probably in about 2002. I don't remember exactly the year and, and month, but I got some Avon DVDs, yoga DVDs, for whatever reason, from my mom, and I kind of just grew my practice from there from home. And then I started uh, going to a class on bass. Uh, one of my teachers, Richard, after a few sessions, uh, suggested that I become a teacher and I wasn't really looking for that but I decided to go to a training and after that I just kind of fell in love with teaching and sharing yoga with anybody that would come to my class and I don't want to say suffer through my class but after taking a lot more classes from other people I was a lot more of a vinyasa power type yoga so we did some crazy stuff as uh, time went on but I have taken a little bit of time off my practice and over the last eight months going to school working full-time and recently just kind of started back into that but I'll talk more about that later uh, so yoga just for me uh, it has given me kind of balance and the ability to see the bigger picture and it's also spiritually opened some opportunities and, and doors for me that I wouldn't have otherwise I'm not a big churchgoer so I spiritually that was kind of where I started with yoga asanas and then going into the 200 hour yoga training and progressing from there is is where I got deeper into the different aspects of yoga uh, but for me it it's become very apparent that I need it for balance because my physical training is pretty rigorous so without yoga um, I become injured quite frequently um, so it's, it's definitely helped me in that aspect but I'm gonna go on to the next slide and talk about complementary medicine I would say that my love for holistic health has probably grown from yoga and just learning more about nature and the universe and how we all come from the same energy and and that opened my eyes after going through a master's in exercise science to a bigger picture of it's not just about the physical body uh, and how do we how do we work with the mind and the spirit to become uh, healthier more productive individuals so cam for me I truly believe that you can't just focus on exercise to fix someone's health you can't focus just on nutrition you really have to get into their sleep relaxation and uh, herbs and the homeopath can really help with all of that and yoga as well so cam just for me it kind of brings it all together into one really uh, amazing kind of idea of looking at the body as a whole and um, treating people in a more of an Eastern medicine way as opposed to just uh, Western medicine where we we look at issues with uh, the body and we try to just throw a drug at it or do surgery without dealing with the spiritual and psychological aspects that go with with an injury and illness so that's kind of the overview of of cam for me is it, you know it's you can't prescribe one uh, medication or one surgery and for everybody and and it's the same way with nutrition plans as well we don't all need a lot of carbs um, some of us can do better with more or less with more and you just really have to sit down and listen to each client and let them kind of tell you um, through their experience and what they're feeling what their issues are and really really dig deep and it's it's hard to do when you just throw throw medicine and at 
um, people and try to fix their, their issues. Um, so adding into CAM, aromatherapy is, the reason I picked CAM was because you could choose not just nutrition and not just aromatherapy, but homeopath as well. And you kind of got a broader sense of what uh, CAM was all about as opposed to just being more specialized and just doing aromatherapy or just doing the nutrition side of the house. Uh, with aromatherapy, it can really help with the chakras. Um, and I, I listed a couple of examples for each chakra and an essential oil that you could use to kind of balance that area of the body. Um, but lately I've been using uh, wet washcloths with my practice and depending on the the type of practice, if it's more of a hot flow or a vinyasa, I'll use maybe a cooler uh, washcloth at the end with some peppermint oil if it's more during the day practice. Um, if it's an evening class, I might still use a cooler washcloth at the end of practice, but maybe do lavender oil. So you can kind of play around with with the essential oils and the temperature of the cloth, and that's usually the easiest thing to to do when you introduce aromatherapy to a yoga class. Um, another thing you could do is also diffuse the oils, um, but you have to be a little bit more careful with that, um, especially if you have a lot of students. And you know, you can aromatherapy by diffusing it, you can uh, kind of stir up some allergies, and people might just not uh, like a fragrance. So if it's aggravating to them and they take a relaxing yoga class, by the end of the class they're going to be aggravated because the scent was not calming to them and it kind of had the opposite effect of what you were going for. So it's helpful to use um, oils like lavender, peppermint, which are most people are pretty familiar with. And also if you're going to diffuse oils, I would definitely uh, talk to this, your students before make sure they don't have any allergies or they're not any adverse reactions to the particular oil that you're going to use. Um, is, but they can be definitely very helpful and very enhancing to a yoga practice. All right. And then uh, homeobotanicals. So I am in my last semester and we have taken, I'm taking a homeopath class right now. And I think they really work well with yoga especially after learning more about how um, the remedies can open up drainage channels and stimulate uh, metabolism and kind of just release those toxins. So you really get almost more bang for your buck when you do a yoga practice and then work closely with um, someone who can make the remedies for you because um, you don't want to just throw anything together. There's a little bit to it. Um, but kind of coupling them together will just, for example, I put um, the HBD remedy with twisting asanas because twisting asanas really helps with digestion and kind of moving everything around in the middle of the body. So if you have someone who doesn't, their digestive system is, they, they're bloated a lot or they just don't, they don't eliminate, eliminate as frequently as they should, just has a lot of, issues with their digestion, whatever it may be, um, the yoga practice can help with that and then you can couple a homeobotanical remedy as well to kind of get things working a little bit faster. Uh, a lot of times the bad thing about, not the bad thing about CAM, but when you're talking about natural remedies, uh, they take a lot longer to work typically. So we're in a Western society where we want everything right now or yesterday or our back hurt yesterday so we wanted it to fi be fixed a week ago and it's I think that's one of our biggest hurdles is getting people to realize that true um, the, a, a true path to wellness takes time so when you couple some of these cam modalities you get those results a little bit quicker so I think that's that's very helpful and encouraging for people as well because we are in such a society that wants quick fixes. All right, so ACHS, uh, why particularly this college? I did a little bit of research. I don't know, one day I just woke up and was like, hey, I want to get another master's degree. So I knew that I wanted to go, initially I looked at holistic nutrition 
but when I saw that ACHS had the CAM program, that fit more up my alley just because I could get a more balanced approach and I wasn't so pigeonholed into just nutrition, which I love, but I think there's more to it than that. And I want to help people. Some people are so, it's, it's hard for them to get their chain to change nutritionally. So you have to work slowly with them and maybe baby steps uh, with, with just changing water, soda for water. Um, and by doing that, it just takes a lot longer for them to get results. So with, when you can add, you know, yoga practice or herbal medicines, uh, essential oil, when you can kind of give them a few more options, I think they see results quicker and that's definitely very positive for them. And whenever you can get people on board as fast as possible, uh, that's always always going to be for your benefit. So I didn't want to just be stuck with one one modality basically. And ACHS had the uh, the military backing, so to speak. They recognize the VA, and the VA recognizes them as an accredited university. And so that's kind of was it for me. I, I didn't really have to look any further from there. And I've been very, very pleased with all of the professors and the program as a whole. Um, I really, it, it was very easy to get started as well. So, and being online was helpful because being in South Carolina, there's not, not really any options for me to go with holistic nutrition or CAM. So I really had to do something that was online. Um, and that, that kind of influenced my choice as well. Uh, hurdles for me, I didn't, didn't really have any once I found out that they accepted the VA um, for tuition. So from that aspect, um, I would say that as far as getting into ACHS and starting a program, it was just once I decided to do it, I just I went for it. And there really wasn't any stopping from there. It was just how many classes could I could I take at a time. And hurdles for the overall career field of yoga and CAM, I would say the biggest thing is that people want the quick fix. And so they go to their doctor because they can get a medication that day that uh, makes them feel better but doesn't actually nine times out of ten fix the problem or they can go to their doctor and say I'm feeling down in the dumps and they can get a, a prescription you know, right there that day that makes them feel better but it, it overall doesn't doesn't actually help them um, and they tend to have to get get more medicine so that's our biggest hurdle is just trying to get people to understand that you didn't get sick overnight and that wellness takes time so, um, and then transitioning, uh, right now I'm still a full-time Air Force employee on the reserve side. I did some active duty time about 11 years and then I <clears throat> decided to go back to school for my master's and that I wanted to pursue other outlets. So I'm in the reserves and I am there full-time doing computer IT related desktop support, um, but this isn't my passion and my passion is sharing health and wellness with others so the plan eventually is to just kind of right now get as much education as I can and then transition over to a, a teaching aspect where hopefully I have my own practice so um, let's see future goals that kind of leads me into that I would love to own my own wellness center either on my own or with a few partners that have the same uh, <clears throat> overall outlook on life with me. And uh, definitely I want to incorporate the CAM modalities into it. I don't want to just have a typical gym. So my wellness center in the grand scheme will have an area for body weights, li uh, lifting, cardio, and then also I want some yoga space and some counseling space where we can hold seminars for nutrition, learn about essential oils, uh, do one-on-one -on -one client um, training and just kind of helping people get feel better about themselves, look better, and do it at their own pace as opposed to just feeling like they have to take everything on at once. 
and then getting discouraged because they get overwhelmed. So it's really important for me to be able to meet people where they are and then educate them and encourage them in a positive manner. And I think that's it for my slides. Great. Thank you so much, Jessica. That was um, really, really fascinating. So I'll go ahead and move on into the questions that we have for you. Um, so really fascinating. You have a degree in exercise and sports science, and you also work as a CrossFit coach and personal trainer, correct? And, I do. Um, yeah, and so can you suggest ways that yoga can be used to improve athletic performance and perhaps be beneficial to athletes just because um, it seems like, you know, sports science and those type of things um, correlate well with, with athletes. So if you have any thoughts on that. Uh, absolutely. So I do a little bit of some asanas within my warm-up when I coach CrossFit. We do a lot of what, what we call inchworms, but is basically um, a modified sun salutation moving across the floor. It's something I do in my own warm-up. It's something I put all of my athletes through. It really gets you – I'm very adamant about them focusing on their breath while they're doing it and not rushing through it. So kind of just feeling their body and getting in touch yeah. with that mind-body connection. Um, but it also just gets the blood flowing, gets the joints lubricated. It's an all-over great way to warm up. But like I said earlier, I took a little bit of a hiatus from teaching yoga. And when I did that, I wasn't able to <laughs> figure out my schedule enough to do my own continue my own practicing of yoga. So I took about eight months old, off and I've recently uh, gone back to practicing over the last probably two months. And in the eight months that I took time off of yoga and I only taught twice a week. So it wasn't a huge, I didn't think it was a huge, huge deal. Like I wouldn't notice that much of a, a decline in my performance, but I have been injured more over the last eight months in probably every joint in my body than I can remember in the last, I don't know, 20 plus years of, of lifting weights. So wow. uh, it's, it was pretty, it was pretty eye opening. And then you know, just for example, my left knee would uh, grind on just random movements, bending, extending the knee. Mm -hmm. um, and it never did that when I was doing practicing yoga. So over the past two months, it's gotten a lot better. It doesn't do it as frequently. Um, and I try to practice, uh, <clears throat> go to class two to three times a week. So, I'm again, I'm not doing it every day. Um, and I still incorporate a little bit of yoga in my warm-ups. But that two to three hours of yoga a week has, I, I mean, I, it, it's really hard to describe um, the way I feel now in my body uh, the, as opposed to the last eight months. So it's it's so important for athletes to do yoga for so different reasons, so many different reasons. Um, some athletes don't get a chance to really relax. So they could do a restorative class and they would benefit immensely just from that. Um, they don't necessarily need a vigorous practice is what I'm trying to get at. They just need to either take time to focus on their breath, which will transfer over to their um, their sport or they need to take time to relax and do some restorative classes or just a yin yoga um, where you just hold stretches and I don't think that that's a bad thing for athletes because as long as they can still move safely um, in their sport a lot of times if they don't don't practice that stretching aspect or the flow of the asanas they'll lose a lot of their mobility and they'll just have more injuries and more issues down the road. Right. So I definitely recommend it. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny you said that about your knee. I experienced, um, you know, even just as a novice yogi, I experienced the same sort of thing when um, I have a lot of pain in my lower back. And when I'm away from yoga, that pain is really noticeable and, and not fun. But then even just after two weeks of, of going to class, it's, it's, diminished at least by 90%, which is kind of incredible. So it's just amazing. It gets all those little kinks and things um, out of you. It's it's funny. I mean, it's obviously, of course, not a cure-all, but it is kind of amazing how it works that way. Absolutely, Renee. I, I totally agree. Mm -hmm. um, 
So you are in the in the Air Force. So how has your yoga career and practice benefited you as a service member? Okay, so teaching yoga uh, has allowed me to find help people find release. So and peacefulness, whatever that means in their life, even if it's just. 45 minutes on the mat to themselves where they don't have to worry about what they're going to cook and who they're going to pick up from school and all the other things that incorporate in our lives that kind of we never get time for ourselves. Um, and it just gives them a chance to relax and, and find their practice. Um, I taught yoga for the Reserve Yellow Ribbon Program for about a year and a half. And that's basically a program where our reservists can go for the weekend before or after they deploy. And there's a bunch of different classes that they take um, from finances to marital classes to relaxation. So I, I was able to teach yoga for that. And just being able to see after a 30, 40 minute session, people leave in their faces and how, how relaxed they felt and looked uh, was rewarding enough for me. I mean, I don't know if any of them ever went on to practice yoga again, uh, but just being able to give them that 30 to 40 minutes of time to themselves was yeah. it, it worth it to me. I, I can't, I, I love being able to do that and, and giving back um, for others. So uh, yeah, it's it's been it's been great to see not only my regular students progress, but just people that come in once or twice for yoga and I may never see them again. Just the feeling that they have on their, or the, that they show on their face when they're done with class is amazing. Definitely. Uh, can you talk about any specific techniques um, that you might tailor for service mm -hmm. members or with your time uh, during the Yellow Whip Ribbon program? Definitely. So I... <laughs> It, it's hard for me to teach just a restorative class. So even in the yellow ribbon, ribbon programs, I'm a big proponent of people getting up and moving. Uh, we sit too much throughout the day, and it's extremely bad for the body. So they're in seminars all day long, and for the 40 minutes that or so that I would have them, they would probably be moving for about 30 minutes of them of those classes. And some people I've had, you know, I've taught people in pants and khakis and dresses so we would just you know modify accordingly but they were up and moving for about 30 minutes and for me it was just more about showing them how strong they could be in their bodies and how great it feels to just move around so I never I would tailor things based on what people were wearing for that type of session and then for my regular classes uh, Basically, it would depend on who I had in there. So my regulars, I knew that I knew what issues they had, ankle, knee replacements, whatever, and what I needed to tailor for them and what stages of the asanas that I needed to put them in um, and where I could push them and put them in plank pose for a little bit longer or they would hold lunges for longer or we would flow through 10 series of sun salutations, just kind of being able to teach the you know normal people or the regulars I call them uh, over and over again gave me that ability so I never really did a specific sequence just for military it was just more about who I had in the class but I would very much be aware of my choices of words so I would never say corpse pose because a lot of times I would have people coming in and out that were just stopping through the base for maybe a, a week or so and so I didn't know what their their background was and whether they had been in combat and what they had seen and, and so forth so definitely just kind of being aware of my words uh, more than specifically tailoring a, a sequence right if that makes sense yeah that that makes that makes complete sense that would uh, yeah sensitivity for sure mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we actually did have a couple questions come in. Um, I think I'm going to uh, let you take this one first, and then I'll open it up to the other two panels as well, because I think all three of you guys could um, have something to say about these two questions. So, And they both have to do with finding places um, to be trained to teach yoga. So the first question is, would you recommend an online yoga teaching class not associated with Yoga Alliance just to gain more knowledge? I'm home with a baby and breastfeeding, so the certification classes aren't an option right now, and it's expensive, but I really want to deepen my practice. 
Do you have any thoughts on that, Jessica? Uh, I do. I think any time you can get, you can educate yourself more, whether it be through a webinar like this or a seminar that's online, um, even if it's a, you know, a total a seminar where you, you go for the weekend but you actually don't learn yoga asanas, but you at least get away and, and learn maybe more of the spiritual aspects of yoga or uh, some Ayurveda, whatever it is that kind of pulls you. I don't think, I would never tell someone that they, they should shy away from getting education. So the only thing I would say is just be, do a little bit of research about their accreditations is probably right. what I would, would recommend for that because you don't want to give just anybody your money, <laughs> your hard-earned <laughs> money. Um, I'm not about giving away money. So yeah. I would be very aware of that, but I don't, I, I would not say that taking an online seminar or a class to gain more knowledge and, and education is a bad idea. It's definitely, because especially since so much of our, our world is, is, through the internet and online and you have to be you know, engaged as much as possible. So you're going to see more and more uh, classes offered you, that are online. Um, but when you get more into the physical asanas and kind of structuring a class and how it flows, um, I would say that's when you need to step out and, and set aside time to actually go to a seminar um, for the weekend or certification for the weekend and do those as much as you can time-wise and obviously money or financially because you're going to want to get the hands-on that you get there through a class. The, the adjustments from other students, uh, teaching other students and seeing their bodies react to your verbal cues is huge. So you're not going to get that from an online class. But if it's just purely education, for a specific subject or just to gain a little bit more knowledge and see if it's even something you're interested in, like really, really delving into, yeah, I would, I would totally recommend it. Right, right. Um, so Jerry and JJ, if you guys have any thoughts on that as well, um, I can open it up to you guys as well before we move on to Jerry's presentation. Yeah, hi. I'd like to say something. Should, should I just go ahead? Sorry. Yeah, JJ, why don't you go ahead and then uh, we'll just move into, Jerry can answer and we'll move into her presentation. That might work first. So let's. Okay. Um, first, uh, to say something on the online uh, classes, I just want to totally agree with Jessica in that, you know, I would uh, agree never to say, you know, stop learning or don't learn just because something's online. Uh, the argument is that yoga is experiential, and so it really needs to be learned in the classroom, yada, yada. But I agree with Jessica in that, you know, there's a lot that can be learned online. I personally teach online classes, and so I, I have to, <laughs> you know, support the, that there is a philosophy and, um, you know, teaching methodology and all kinds of things that you can learn in an online class. So I wholeheartedly um, uh support that. And then I did want to just make another comment on, agree with Jessica when she was talking about restorative yoga and, um, um, and getting, versus getting people moving. And I think I want to agree with Jessica that, you know, my philosophy is that when somebody is um, in need of what, you know, quote unquote, restorative yoga, um, it usually means there is some sort of stuck Ness, stuck energy and you don't overcome that stuck energy by you know sitting around you know lay propping yourself up with bolsters and sitting in a pose for five minutes and so um, instead oops did I hit something instead um, gentle movement and that to me is restorative yoga so the movement call, you know, that people are calling restorative yoga out there where basically it's, you know, very prop intensive and a lot of bolsters and blankets and things and you prop yourself up in a position and stay there for five or ten minutes. To me, that's, um, that is pretty advanced to be able to find a position that you can hold for that length of time. And uh, for many people, it's uncomfortable yoga and not restorative. 
And so I just wanted to agree with Jessica on her um, ideas on that. Yeah, yeah, really, really wonderful thoughts. So, um, okay, so I'll go ahead and pass it on to Jerry if you uh, have any comments on the, um, on the question or anything from Jessica's presentation. You can go ahead and um, go ahead and jump in now, and then you can go ahead and start your presentation. So, thank you so much, Jessica. Um, that was wonderful, and we'll move on to Jerry. Okay, thank you, Renee. Um, I was just really going to say that I think Jessica and JJ um, both covered the question beautifully regarding the online um, training. You know, I think there's a lot to gain through online training. I just think you need to be a little careful as far as what your intention is, I mean, what you're trying to gain from the training, and then what um, the program's intention is, what, what it's there to offer. So, um, yeah, I think it can be a great thing as long as it's... Um, know what it is you're you're looking for. 